after having a broad overview on phase transformation and the important concept of a critical radius for phase transformations, let us look at melting of nanocrystals. We had noted that um, we have a well defined melting point T m at which the entire lattice breaks and therefore, you have a molten state and <coughs> this is unlike the freezing which we had talked about. On the other hand, when we talked about the melting point, it was uh, the melting point of what is known as a bulk crystal or a large crystal. The melting point of a material is an indicator of the bronze strength of the material, though the boiling point is a better reference as it is structure independent. In the solid state for instance, you have various kind of phases possible like the BCC crystal or the FCC crystal and this would affect the melting point, but boiling point is from the liquid state to the uh, <coughs> gaseous state and that is a better indicator of the uh, bond strength, but nevertheless melting point also gives you a some kind of an indication of what is the bond strength in a material. In bulk system surface to volume ratio is small and curvature effects can be ignored that essentially implies we can talk about a single number known as the bulk melting point. In nano crystals the number of surface atoms is considerable fraction of the total number of atoms and these atoms as we know have got a higher energy and a higher degree of freedom which means they have freedom of more vibration as compared to the uh, uh, atoms in the bulk. This implies as a first intuitive guess that surface atoms are expected to melt below the melting point of the bulk. So, though this is a how much is it true, how much it does it stand, stand to experimental results, we will come scrutiny, we will see in a moment, but as a first intuitive guess we would expect that surface atoms because of the higher energy they have got and the higher freedom they uh, enjoy, they would tend to melt before the bulk atoms. And we have already noted that in 0 d and 1 d nanocrystals curvature effects are important and cannot be ignored. Now, as the size of a freestanding nano crystal is reduced below about say for instance about 100 nanometer and I am talking about single crystals which are freestanding, it is noticed that its melting point is reduced with respect to the bulk melting point. In fact, experiments have shown that gold crystals about 10 nanometers in size melt about 100 degrees below the melting point of the bulk. So, there is a considerable depression in the melting point when you go to nanoscale <coughs> and for that we really have to go really good small sizes like about 10 nanometers and uh, the bulk melting point of gold happens to be 1064 degrees Celsius. Now, there is a continuum formula which exists and we will uh, though how correct is this formula or how accurate it is we will ignore for now and we will consider a formula in which the melting point of the surface is uh, uh, given with respect to the melting point of the bulk material and the formula goes as uh, T surface melting is T m into 1 minus 2 gamma solid liquid by delta H f into R where T m is as we noted is the bulk melting point. The surface melting point that means as if we are assuming now that the surface atoms are melting first. The gamma solid liquid is the solid liquid interfacial energy and delta H f is the enthalpy of fusion of the bulk material and R is the radius of the particle. The important take home message from this formula is that <coughs> if I reduce my size that means if R decreases then the surface T m surface um, would decrease that means that there will because this is 1 minus this fraction and therefore, you would notice that if I decrease my uh, radius of the particle which means also that curvature is going to increase then I would note that the T m surface would actually decrease that means the surface atoms would show a uh, depression in the melting point with respect to the bulk melting point. Now, if I now track my melting point with vis a vis the radius of the particle then of course, you have the bulk melting point and this is some kind of a schematic drawn um, <coughs> schematic trend line which is drawn for gold nanoparticles. Then we notice that there is a severe depression in the melting point as you reduce the size and this starts to play a considerable role when the size of the particle is below about 50 nanometers. And we already noted that when the size is 10 nanometers there is almost a 100 degrees depression in the melting point. Now, this implies there are two points we have talked about and these two points need to be resolved and the first point we mentioned is that surface would tend to melt below the melting point of the bulk this is point number 1 and we, we, we have a few more things to say regarding that how true is it or how true it is not. Second thing we are noticing an experimental result wherein you are noticing that actually the melting point of a nano crystal and now I am not differentiating the surface from the interior I am assuming that the entire nano crystal is melting and this we have seen there is a depression in the melting point of the nano crystal. 
and this trend line which is seen for gold can also be observed for other materials like lead, copper, bismuth, silicon and the trend lines are very similar. In other words, if you go below about 50 nanometer size, there is a dif depression in the melting point. Now, the question obvious question which arises is that is the surface melting first and therefore, the next layer becomes a surface, then the next layer becomes a surface or the next layer becomes then therefore, there is a continuous melting from outward to inward. There are two possibilities. So, let me write down the scenario of melting. So, there is one possibility that the surface actually melts first. So, this layer gets molten which means now the effective surface is moved inward and this is the new surface and which is even smaller in size and since the temperature is already above the melting point of the surface this crystal it is definitely this is going to be above the melting point of this crystal and therefore, my melting would progress inward. This is scenario 1. The other possibility is that the entire crystal melts at a single temperature and now I call it of course, the T m of the nano crystal, which is now obviously, a function of the radius r. <coughs> now, which of this two is true uh, is a important question is it that the melting actually happens in the surface and progresses inward or does the whole nano particle melt at a single temperature. And let us answer this question that where does melting start first. A simple minded guess would be that the melting starts at the surface of the nano crystal as the formula I pointed out in the previous slide, but in actual experiments and the one which I would like to cite now is the Wang et al which is goes back to 1999, uh, which they did on gold nano rods heated by laser a laser beam. They found that they could not differentiate the melting of the surface from the interior and both the inside and of the nano crystal and the surface seem to actually melt as a whole though more work has to be done on various systems and more careful experimentation has to reveal really does actually the surface melt before the interior. But as it stands today the understanding seems to be that it is not a scenario 1 which is operative, but a scenario 2 wherein actually the whole nano crystal melts at a single temperature which is what you expect for the bulk crystal. In a bulk crystal you you define a melting point which is not surface interior etcetera dependent. So, you expect that it is melting at a single temperature though as I pointed out more work has to be actually done to understand this phenomenon. Now, it is not always necessary that this nano crystal need be a free standing nano crystal often this nano crystal it could be embedded in a matrix like for instance to the way to produce lead nano crystal is to actually melt spin melt spinning is a technique in which you actually take uh, you melt your lead and aluminum together and spin it in the form of a ribbon and often you will get lead nano particles which are embedded in a matrix and a schematic of such a system is shown here wherein for instance this lead is the this lead could be this phase which is the black phase or and this could be the matrix okay, which could be aluminum. So, another in this system the nano particles or the nano crystals are not free standing but they are embedded in a matrix. In such a scenario, uh, there is an extension of the concept we just now saw about melting that it is now not purely we cannot say that there is going to be a depression or an elevation in the melting point both of which are possible we will have to take it system by system. So, if the crystal is embedded in a matrix its melting point may decrease or increase with respect to the bulk depending on the relative magnitudes of the particle matrix that means, a crystal matrix and liquid matrix interfacial energies. So, now if I know the relative magnitudes of these two the crystal matrix and the liquid matrix interfacial energies I can predict will I have a depression in the melting point or will there be something known as superheating which is means an elevation in the melting point. Now, if gamma particle matrix is greater than the gamma liquid matrix in other words the gamma liquid matrix is the lower of the two interfacial energies then formation of the interfacial liquid lowers the energy it is obvious. Therefore, now suppose originally there was an unmolten state in which case I had this particle in a matrix and now the interfacial relevant interfacial energy is for the solid with the liquid which is gamma solid or particle matrix. Now, if instead of this this thing melts this is region of space melts then I will re have to replace it with this quantity which is now my now this is a molten state in which case I can replace this by gamma liquid matrix. 
and since gamma liquid matrix is lower in energy it would rather melt at a lower so to overall reduce the energy of the system and that means there will be a depression in the melting point. The opposite would be true if the gamma particle matrix is lower than the gamma liquid matrix. In such a case you would observe an elevation in melting point which is called superheating and the embedded crystal will melt above its bulk melting point and this is observed in an example of aluminum indium alloy matrix. So, suppose you had aluminum indium particles in an aluminum alloy matrix then you would actually observe an elevation in melting point which is called superheating. So, just to summarize the slides related to uh, melting we observe that uh, <coughs> if you have free standing nano crystals then there is a depression in the melting point which could be a large fraction of the overall melting point for instance if this is if 100 degrees uh, depression would imply that there is about 10 percent reduction in melting point if you reduce the crystal site size to about 10 nanometer. Second thing we noticed is that as the understanding stands today that the entire nanoparticle melts at a single temperature rather than the surface inward melting which could be also be a possibility which needs to be explored. Now <coughs> and the third thing we noticed was that if I have this nano crystal not as a free nano crystal, but as embedded in a matrix then there could be an elevation in the melting point or there could be a depression in the melting point that depends on the relative interfacial energies between the solid and the liquid or the crystal and the matrix. Now, let us take up the example of solid to solid phase transformation in nano crystals and uh, we already noticed that in when you are talking about uh, for instance uh, liquid to solid or a solid to liquid phase transformation then I can ignore something known as the strain energy. <coughs> but when you talk about solid to solid phase transformation still the concept of an R star is valid, but in the calculation of R star I need to invoke the uh, strain energy term as well <coughs> that is what we had noted before. Phase transformations in nano crystals is expected to be different from bulk materials. So, this is very obvious and we will see why it is obvious very soon. Heterogeneous nucleation at the surface is expected to play a dominant role due to its proximity. So, far we said that suppose I am doing a melt uh, solidification experiment and suppose I do this experiment for instance in a containerless method that means I have no container there is no wall then I can reasonably expect that homogeneous nucleation is going to take place. But in a solid to solid phase transformation it is heterogeneous nucleation which is going to be a dominant form of nucleation because you cannot avoid defects in a material like there are going to be grain boundaries there are going to be stacking faults there are going to be dislocations and the even enriched regions of vacancies have known to be plain uh, have no are known to play a role in heterogeneous nucleation. So, heterogeneous nuclei and in the case of nanoparticles there is one defect which is very close to the bulk of the material which is the surface and therefore, surface is expected to play an important role in heterogeneous nucleation in nano crystals or heterogeneous nucleation leading to a phase transformation in nano crystals. Additionally we also expect that the activation energies for phase transformation is expected to be different from the bulk which is a not an unreasonable expectation. Additionally apart from the thermodynamic aspects we also would notice that the kinetics of phase transformation is expected to be highly enhanced with respect to the bulk and the reason obvious or we list the three reasons important reasons that smaller length scale for diffusion involved. And suppose I am talking about a diffusional transformation for now like we have been doing so far the first order diffusional transformation which produce by nucleation which progress by nucleation and growth. Then I would notice that the, since the overall particle size is very very small the overall length scale for diffusion for phase transformation to be completed is going to be small it is of the going to be order of nano scale. Then there are going to be other effects like surface diffusion which are going to play a prominent role because now uh, uh, the entire material is dominated by surface. Then the third important point is that there is going to be lesser constraint on the system. We had noted that previously by drawing some schematics that how if I take a region out of a material and it transforms to a different volume then I have to refit that material into the bulk of the material which is going to give rise to strain energy. But suppose the system is very small then the free surfaces can actually relax and therefore, the system is less constrained that implies that phase transformation typically involve uh, volume changes and the, since the amount of constraining material is less the transformed volume stresses caused by the transformation are lower and that means that there is going to be less impediment 
to the phase transformation and we had noted earlier that actually the, you know, the out of the three terms energy is involved in a phase transformation it the interfacial energy and the strain energy term tends to oppose the phase transformation and since now the system is less constrained that means if there is a volume change or a shape change this can easily be accommodated because there is a free surface in proximity and that implies that typically the strain energy term is going to be a lower term in a nano crystal transformation as compared to a bulk transformation. So, let us understand this. Now, suppose I have a bulk crystal and I have a certain region which is transforming and assume that after transformation this volume becomes like this. That means, there is a shape change and there is a volume change. Now, in the case of the bulk this transformed volume has to be reinserted into this volume and therefore, there is going to be a lot of strain energy term. In the case of a nano crystal, there is no surrounding medium therefore, this transformation can proceed with lesser constraint and therefore, and additionally we have already noted that suppose there, there can be surface diffusion dominance, there can also be the overall length scale for diffusion for this could be small and therefore, if even if it is a diffusional transformation or a diffusion less shear transformation the overall uh, expectation is that the strain energy term is going to be a small term and many many a times you may, we may like to ignore the strain energy term in the phase transformation. Now, we have already noted many times before that in bulk materials multiple nucleation events are necessary and uh, we all characterize nucleation as nucleation rate that means, number of nuclei forming per unit time per unit volume and that is what leads to phase transformation. <coughs> so, suppose uh, and the schematic is shown here for that. So, you have a region of material wherein there is certain nuclei which form the black dots and with time these nuclei grow and as these nuclei grow and fresh nuclei formed in different regions and finally, the entire volume is transformed. So, you the new transformed volume. So, it is actually should be shaded black. So, maybe it is a good idea to shade the whole region black because now this is the transformed volume which is now the black material. Okay. Now, in the case of nano crystals the size of the transformation nucleus may become comparable to the volume of material and when we talked about this r star the critical size for nucleation nucleus we noted that it is of the order of 1 to 10 nanometer is of the order of the nano scale. Okay. And therefore, a single nucleation event may lead to a solid to solid phase transformation in a nano crystal which is very very different from the case of a bulk crystal. And the schematic is shown here that you have a nano crystal at the bottom which is shown by A and I assume that the nano crystal is of the order of nanometers. Then a single nucleation event is as good as transforming the material entire material and therefore, the transformed material is shown on the right. There have been some good research work and this has typically been done on materials like C D S C and C D S which are semiconductors and the particle size range of 2.3 to 4.3 nanometers shows that for pressure induced transformation and now this is not that usual heating transformation, but uh, pressure induced transformation. Uh, it is seen that for a transformation from the wood side to the rock salt structure, wood side happens to be a Z and O type of structure which is um, an hexagonal kind of a structure which has an A and C parameters as given here. On the other hand the rock salt structure is a familiar NATL, NACL type structure which is cubic and you can notice here that the uh, rock wood side structure has a higher volume per motif as compared to the uh, rock salt structure. That means, if I increase the pressure the tendency would be to actually convert this wood side to rock salt and uh, this uh, pressure typically is of the order of giga Pascals. And uh, if you apply 3 giga Pascal it is seen that, uh, that a single nucleation event can lead to the transformation of the whole volume. And that implies that this situation is very very different from that of a bulk crystal wherein nucleation alone does not lead to transformation there has to be nucleation followed by growth. Now, uh, of course, there is has to be a transition from the uh, nucleation event to a single nucleation event to a bulk system wherein there is multiple nucleation events and the transition occurs via what is known as a single nucleation followed by growth regime. So, now I can divide my uh, size regimes into three parts. One is this very small regime of the order of 2 nanometers, one 
a mean intermediate size regime of the order of 10 nanometers or maybe 10 to 15 of course, this depends on system to system and in this case of course, I am taking the example of CDSE or CDS crystals and therefore, if I change the system these numbers would be different. And the third is the bulk, which is now I'm, when I am talking about bulk, it could be more than about 100 nanometers or 500 nanometers, which I call a bulk system. In the small nanoscale regime, I notice that this 2 nanometer is of the same order of magnitude as the R star, my critical nucleus rate, nucleation radius. So, this of the order of critical nucleation radius and therefore, a single nucleation event can lead to phase transformation. In this intermediate size particles like about 10 nanometer particles, we notice that single nucleation can lead to a phase transformation, but there needs to be a certain growth because the nucleus size as you can see here as indicated by this black is actually smaller than the particle, but then there is not sufficient region around it for a second nucleus to form with that means, given a small size and therefore, this nucleus grows leading to a complete phase transformation. And finally, of course, you have the bulk wherein which is as I told you could be of the order 100 nanometers or more multiple nucleation events followed by growth which is the usual mechanism for bulk crystals. Now, further if you look at closely at the uh, 2 nanometer size crystals which is you can see was a uh, reason for or in the same region as the experimental study which is from 2.3 to 4.3 nanometers you notice that you can subdivide this region into very small sizes which wherein the, uh, the nucleation event is interface control that means, surface control and you can talk about uh, uh, what you might call uh, a volume control regime which is slightly bigger than those very small volumes. So, let me summarize this very important slide uh, since R star which is a critical nucleation radius is of the order of nanometers usually typically 1 nanometer or to say maybe 10 nanometers in some systems not assume a system like CDSE or CDS, wherein it is of the order of 1 nanometer. Then a single nucleation event can lead to a phase transformation, which is unlike the bulk crystals. Now, uh, the important work on CDSE has been done on this uh, pressure induced transformation and the pressure for transformation is pretty high of the order of giga Pascals. We and we are talking about the phase transformation from the woodside structure to the rock salt structure. That means, from an hexagonal structure it is going to a cubic structure and that it since it is pressure induced transformation we expect that there is going to be a reduction in volume of the unit cell which is what is seen here from the volume of the unit cells. And in such a system we see that in small scales a single nucleation event is enough to cause the entire transformation of the volume. Now, nucleation could occur in the bulk or on the surface and uh, the activation energy for the transformation is seen to increase with size regime size constraint. So, if you are talking about the experiments conducted in the CDSE and CDS and you are talking about these nanoscale particles, then the activation energy for the transformation is seen to increase with size. At larger crystallized sizes single nucleation event is followed by growth of transformation to be complete which we noted before. Additionally, we note that smaller crystallites require higher pressure for transformation. And this for this particular case, we will see more examples and we will actually we will see one more example, wherein we will actually note the pressure at which smaller crystals transform as compared to larger crystals both being in the nano scale. In another example we consider here and here we are taking up some illustrative examples, but much of this can be, uh, the concepts can actually be applied across many very many systems including metallic systems and other systems. In silicon and now we are talking about SiO2 coated silicon pressure induced transformation from diamond cubic to primitive hexagonal structure. We it is seen that crystals as large as 50 nanometers transform by a single nucleation event. So, here we noted that uh, for instance that it is about of the order of 2 nanometers that be a single uh, about 10 nanometers sorry of the order of 10 nanometers that a single nucleation event is responsible, but in other systems this size can as long as be as long as 50 nanometers. And this also tells us that the concept is applicable to broader class of systems and in this case we have to especially note that it is not a free standing silicon crystal, but it is some kind of a core shell structure where silicon is coated with SiO2 and this is a natural can be also thought of as a natural consequence of the oxidation of the silicon crystal. And as expected the shape of the crystals change on phase transformation and this is of course, a homogeneous deformation we are talking about. And bulk behavior in this case of the silicon uh, is expected to take over after about 100 nanometers. So, it is clear that when you study more than one size system that up to about 50 nanometers seems to be the regime where you can actually have 
a single nucleation event of course, it could be nucleation followed by growth, but a single nucleation event is uh, responsible for the entire phase transformation. And when you go to uh, for instance, uh, um, about 100 nanometer or more, we can assume that it is bulk like behavior with respect to uh, what you might call uh, the phase transformation by nucleation and growth. So, now we are taking a more and more examples, we are seeing more and more examples and we had asked and very early in the course, we had asked a question that what is bulk. So, now with respect to nucleation and uh, phase transformation, we can see that a 100 nanometer crystal can be called bulk, even though we know it is a nano scale crystal, because in terms of the mechanism for phase transformation, it is no different from a bulk crystal or, or it is not very different from bulk crystal, because now you have multiple nucleation events followed by growth. So, I can call it bulk like, even though it is still in the nano scale. Another example of a solid to solid phase transformation, which has been studied is the transformation from gamma F e 2 O 3 to alpha F e 2 O 3. Again, this is pressure induced phase transformation and this gamma F e 2 O 3 is actually a, a metastable form at room temperature with respect to the alpha form. This is a cubic form and it is volume of the unit cell is about 0.58. The alpha form and uh, which is a low smaller unit cell is actually a rhombohedral crystal and uh, it has got a and c parameters as a equal to 0 0.504 and c is 1.37 is an alumina form of a crystal. So, you have two forms one with a larger unit cell one with a smaller unit cell and this transformation as uh, as you can as as perhaps uh, you can guess that can be driven by pressure. And the important thing to note is that as you decrease the size and now we are really in the very small scale regime 7 nanometer to 5 nanometer to 3 nanometer you can see that the transformation pressure actually increases. That means, for smaller and smaller particles actually you need larger and larger pressures for phase transformation to take place. And of course, these pressures are employed by using a diamond anvil and uh, uh, so there are inherent uh, complications in actually studying the in situ phase transformation and getting the signal of how the transformation has taken place. So, these are very careful experiments which have to be conducted, but the general trend line seems to be that as you reduce the crystallite size you need to apply more and more uh, pressure for phase transformation to take place. Uh, next we take up a uh, couple of more physical properties uh, and uh, so both of these are actually vast areas of research wherein lot of work has been done, but we will take a small sample of results to understand that how nano materials can actually be different from bulk materials. And as usual we take up those examples where the demarcation is very clear cut and often there is a startling or a very different kind of a variation as compared to the bulk. So, that we can understand that at the nano scale there are some very interesting effects which we do not observe in the bulk materials. <coughs> so, let us uh, one of those physical properties we talk about now next is that thermal conductivity. We know that thermal conduction occurs due to electrons and phonons in normal metallic materials electrons are the dominant form of conduction, but suppose I am talking about a diamond we know that diamond has no free electrons and therefore, or very little free electrons at room temperature. Therefore, it is phonons which are uh, responsible for thermal conduction. Actually, diamond happens to be a very good thermal conductor. In fact, if one holds a diamond uh, blade and actually cuts through ice, the heat of the hand can actually be conducted very nicely through the diamond and it will actually cut ice very nicely. And this phononic mode of conduction as you know phonons are quantized normal modes of lattice vibrations. And uh, later on we will talk about plasmons in the context of optical properties. Uh, plasmons are collective oscillations of electrons, while phonons are collective oscillations of quantized oscillations of um, <coughs> elastic oscillations of atoms or we may call lattice vibrations. In nano materials the phonon wavelength can be comparable to the length scale of the microstructure or in the case a nano particle itself. Okay. So, this is an important point that means phonons can get confined in the material, because now it cannot travel through the medium. So, that is an important point to note. And therefore, you do expect that when phononic conduction is the dominant form of conduction that in nano scale materials things are going to be very different. Even in cases where electronic conduction is the important uh, mechanism you do expect that it is going to be different from the normal materials. Now, if you talk about phonon wavelength you can write down E phonon is h v by lambda v is the velocity of sound and the uh, momentum of photon h by lambda putting together we can see the lambda phonon is of the order of 10 power minus 10 or in some cases you can talk about it of the or being in the nano scale. Now, <coughs> in experiments there are two at least two experiments we will take up. Um, 
and or two results we will summarize here and both of these results are you might say opposite sides of the whole spectrum. One is the case of carbon nanotubes where you see an highly enhanced thermal conductivity which is occurring because of phonons and in fact you observe something like about 3000 watt per meter per Kelvin which is 7 times or more than that for copper and this is observed in carbon nanotubes along the length and this is expected to be because of the phononic mechanism. Now, um, we later on when we talk about conduction electrical conduction we will also notice that in carbon nanotubes you can actually have electric electrical transport which is ballistic again that means unimpeded transport of electrons across the length of the carbon nanotube which means that you can have ballistic conduction. So, you can see the thermal conductivities and electronic conductivities along carbon nanotubes is very high and uh, the result which is contrary to that we are also talking about which we will take up now is the case of nano size platinum films and we are talking about in plane conductivity and its dependence on thickness. So, we have two examples in front of us one is the case of the carbon nanotube wherein phononic conductivity is giving us very high conductivity as compared to even that of copper along the length of the tube. The other case is the case of platinum where you expect free electrons to be present and we notice that the in plane conductivity of these thin films these are platinum thin films actually decreased with size. Now, suppose I am talking about thermal conductivity and it is plot with temperature then you notice that for platinum bulk that the thermal conductivity actually decreases with temperature which is the normal behavior you would observe because now you are going to have more and more collisions of electrons with phonons and therefore, you actually will have a decreased mean free path and therefore, you expect that the resistance of the material is going to actually decrease increase which is a case of electrical conductivity and similarly you, you would also notice that the thermal conductivity is actually going to degrade with temperature. So, the thermal conductivity and electric conductivity both you expect to degrade with temperature and which is what you see in the case of the platinum bulk. Now, if you take about talk about in plane thermal conductivity of platinum thin films there are two important things to be noticed which are both of which are uh, unexpected and startling in some sense. Number one is that the overall conductivity value for any given temperature actually is much much lower. So, you can see that a 28 nanometer film the conductivity for instance you take at uh, temperature like 120 Kelvin you notice that it is about 20 and this is slightly less than 80. So, there is a considerable reduction in the thermal conductivity at any given temperature and here even at a higher temperature 300 Kelvin you notice this is about 30 and this is about 70. So, it is more than double uh, or two and a half times reduced with respect to the bulk value. Further you also noticed if the film size is made thinner then the thermal conductivity actually decreases even even more. That means, a 15 nanometer film is actually having a lower thermal conductivity as compared to a 28 nanometer film which is having a lower thermal conductivity as compared to the bulk. So, therefore, we keep on increasing the thickness at some point of time I would perhaps have a transition from what you might call the nano scale regime to the bulk regime. Now, there is another important effect which we see from the curve which is very different from that of the bulk and this is seen in the regime of 70, 70 to about 340 Kelvin which in which is a regime in which the experimentation was done in the platinum films. And you can notice that in this regime actually the thermal conductivity increases with temperature. In the case of the bulk semiconductor you already noticed that the thermal conductivity decreases with temperature, but unlike the bulk for the nano size films the thermal conductivity actually increased with temperature. So, the true startling effects in the case of uh, materials having electronic conductivity number one is that the thermal conductivity actually increased with temperature in the nano scale materials and number two the thermal conductivity of the nano scale material and I am talking about in plane conductivity of films and this is not nano particles this is not nano tubes, but actually films and this films is much lower than the bulk counterparts. And this is in contrast with a, a nano structure like um, carbon nanotube wherein you actually observe much higher or a highly enhanced uh, thermal conductivity along the length of a carbon nanotube. 
So, though we have only considered a very little part of the whole story of the thermal conductivity, but this I hope can uh, convey the uh, what you call important message that the thermal conductivity of nano materials is going to be very, very different from that of the bulk materials. And this ha may have important consequences when you are actually de designing devices and you are worried about the cooling of these devices, because there is a lot of heat generated because of and you may want to put very design various strategies for the cooling purposes. And you will notice that the cooling rate or the dissipation of heat through these some of these for instance nano structures is going to be very different from that of the bulk. And therefore, that aspect has to be kept in mind when de, uh, devices are designed. The next uh, property which perhaps is uh, in some sense is very much related to the other properties we have been seeing before, uh, which is related to the surface property. Okay. Because in some sense the conduction we were talking about is more dominant by the bulk and rather than the surface, but in catalysis it is clear that uh, it is a surface effect which is very, very important and we know what is a catalyst. A catalyst is something which enhances the rate of the reaction, but it itself does not get consumed by the reaction. So, that is an important thing about the catalyst that it itself does not uh, get consumed and you know a lot of uh, industries rely upon good catalysts for industrial production and catalysts are known to play an important role in reactions like oxidation of hydrogen, hydrogenation of hydrocarbons, oxidation of carbon monoxide polypropylene epioxidation etcetera. Again like before uh, we will view this from a slightly cla classical viewpoint and also we will take up only a couple of examples which are startling while the literature on this area is again extremely vast and uh, it as because of the industrial application this is also very very useful to study catalysis and especially the role of nanoparticles and nanocrystals in catalysis. If you look at the history of the material only about 12 metals they and these typically belong to groups 8 and 1 b which are elemental catalysts. So, there are very small representation of the whole element periodic table which are naturally catalysts. Most widely used ones of those are 3 d metals like iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, 4 d metals like rhenium, palladium, silver and 5 d metals like platinum. So, these are some of the usually used catalysts for these some of these reactions which we have seen before. Copper is used in the catalysis of uh, methanol, methanol production by hydrogenation of carbon monoxide and silver is used in the production of ethylene oxide by the reaction of ethylene with oxygen. So, there are some examples. Now, how does this catalytic activity come in? So, again we go back a little back in time perhaps and take a classical viewpoint and try to understand this that group 8 metals owe their catalytic activity to an optimum vacancy in the D band like nickel and palladium they have a some kind of an optimum vacancy in the D band and therefore, these group 8 metals have you expect them to be having some catalytic activity. On the other hand if you look at copper, silver and gold they have a completely filled D band, but by the virtue that they have a low ionization potential and they can lose electrons from the D band these can also function as catalysts in bulk form. So, therefore, uh, either you need to have an vacancy in the D band or if you have a low ionization potential then you expect that such a material would be able to perform the role of a catalyst and this reaction we could be talking about is the example of ethylene uh, reaction ethylene oxygen production ethylene oxide or hydrogenation of carbon monoxide etcetera. Gold if you look at gold does not satisfy any of these criteria and it has an high ionization potential like 9.23 and therefore, you expect gold to perform poorly as a catalyst in bulk form. So, the classically in bulk form if you see gold then you would say a gold is not going to be a catalyst and therefore, I would discard it in the bulk form to play the role of a catalyst. Um, instead of talking about bulk crystals suppose I am talking about nanoparticles then it is obvious that nanoparticles are expected to have a certain better catalytic property as compared to bulk materials and these comes from two obvious effects. One is the increase in surface area per unit volume and the increase in surface activity to a high degree of unsaturated bonds. So, we do expect already that when you go to the nano scale there will be a certain uh, benefit in using a catalyst in the nano crystalline or nano form. Now, we just noted that gold actually does not perform good when you are talking about a bulk uh, gold, but then it has been found that gold can actually be used as a catalyst in the nano form. So, gold has a high ionization potential thus giving it poor affinity for molecular hydrogen and oxygen and expected to perform poorly as a catalyst for hydrogenation and oxidation reaction under ambient conditions. Of course, it should be noted that the poor catalytic activity is for smooth gold surfaces at low temperatures. So, this is what we are referring to and the expectation is that gold is not a very good catalyst. 
and it is very surprising that gold can perform the role of a catalyst in nano form. Gold displays a drastic change in behavior and reduction of size. Gold nanoparticles supported on substrates like Fe 2 O 3 and NiO can be used as a catalyst for CO oxidation even at low temperatures like 473 degrees Celsius. So, the observation is that now gold which is not a bulk catalyst can actually be used as a catalyst in nano form and needless to say we have already noted before that these gold nano particles cannot be kept uh, in touch with each other then they will tend to coagulate therefore, they are typically is embedded in a substrate and these substrates have noted to be Fe 2 O 3 and NiO and we will note shortly the relevance and the importance of the substrate in this whole process, but the important thing to note is that that gold now in nano form can be used as a catalyst and this is a very startling expectation or startling behavior. Factors which play an important role in catalytic, catalytic properties of gold are first of course, when you are talking about gold nano particles size that means, size and size distribution and shape of the gold nano particle and additionally which is the important point is the substrate. That means, what is the type of the support, what is the interface with the support uh, substrate which is having all these plays an important role in final outcome of the gold nano particles uh, catalytic behavior. We already noted that gold nano particle melts at lower temperatures as compared to bulk materials. For instance, we have noted that 5 nanometer gold actually melts 200 degrees below the melting point and this enhances the coagulation tendency and nano particles are left in contact. And we have also noted that actually nano particles can sinter at temperatures much lower than and we have noted the role of vacancies in this process of sintering and therefore, we cannot leave these gold nano particles in touch with each other they have to be isolated and the substrate therefore, performs the first important role of isolating these gold nano particles. And, but the important thing which comes out of the study which the experimental study is that there are additional benefits with respect to catalysis of using the substrate. And we have noticed two substrates we noted before Fe 2 O 3 and NiO. Now, when I embedded embed a gold nano particle in a substrate there are important parameters which automatically come about what is of course, the shape of the gold nano particle is the embedding partial like this uh, picture on the right or is it more to more like this wherein the particle is not embedded deep into the substrate. So, we could have a range of embeddings. So, if I have a substrate so my gold nano particle could be embedded such that only a small part of it is embedded it could be such that it is almost like a semicircle or it could be even deeper embedded. And what is the difference between all these of course, it is of course, the surface area of gold which is exposed which is going to be this number this area. And you can see that the surface area of gold is actually decreasing as you go from a small embedding to a large embedding. Additionally, there is one more parameter to be noted in this embedding and that is the interface. Suppose, I look at the three dimensional figure of this I can actually notice that when I have a particle which is embedded then I would have actually a circular interface which is the line of contact between the particle and the substrate. So, this area interface or a triple point length which is the interface between the gold nano particle the substrate and air and that length would change depending on the embedding. So, in this case the length is small in this case it is the maximum possible and in this case there is somewhat intermediate length of embedding. That means, now the triple line which is passing as the interface between the three phases that is also changing depending on the embedding. Now, this has important consequence on the catalysis and we will note that by reading this phrase here the substrate used in sub as support in the gold nanoparticle particle plays a profound role in catalytic properties of the system. First of all the substrate determines the contact angle with which the gold nano particles make with the substrate and which is of course, size dependent. Gold and titania 2 nanometer particles tended to wet the surface while larger particles 5 nanometer have a contact angle of 90 degrees that means, 90 degree means partial wetting and in the case of uh, 2 nanometer particles which is extremely small particles they tend to form a uniform coverage that means, there is a wetting tendency. So, the wetting tendency itself is a function of the size of the nano particle this wetting also is going to tell you what is the amount of interface that the gold nano particles will have with the substrate which in turn plays a profound role in the catalysis. Hemispherical particles with more interface perimeter show higher catalytic efficiency than spherical particles attached to the substrate. So, if you compare the two pictures which are drawn here schematically below one is the case of the 
non wetting kind of a situation where the particle is sitting virtually outside versus a case of a 90 degree contact angle which wherein the perimeter area is large then you notice that the one which is embedded nicely is the one or an uh, hemispherical cap kind of a embedding is actually giving you a higher catalytic activity as compared to the one which is not wetting the surface. It is understood that the reacting species adsorb on the surface and interface defects like ledges kings and interface lines. So, interface lines play an important role apart from ledges and kings which anyhow exist on the gold surface in determining the catalytic activity. At room temperature and low temperatures about less than 300 Kelvin gold nanoparticles beat platinum and palladium hands down by 4 orders of magnetic magnitude in their catalytic activity. If you go back and look at this slide where we have talked about a catalyst we have noted that platinum are and gold are well known catalysts platinum and palladium are well known catalysts, but gold we said in bulk form is not a catalyst, but when you go to nano scale it looks like the roles are reversed and you can actually note that gold can outperform platinum palladium of course, in a certain uh, regime of temperature certain regime of embedding that it can actually go and beat platinum and palladium with respect to the catalytic activity. And here we are talking about of course, as I said a limited regime we are where is the cobalt carbon monoxide oxidation reaction has been studied and, um, and this is understood due to the low activation energy of about 30 kilo joule per mole for use by, for by using gold nano crystals. Therefore, we see that um, when you go to the nano scale there are behaviors which are highly unexpected and this is this continues to be so in the case of catalysis where in spite of gold not being in the list of the usual known catalysts like uh, the 3D metals like uh, and the 4D metals and 5D metals like platinum, palladium, silver, cobalt, but we find that when you go to the nano scale and especially uh, when we are trying to track catalytic activity of gold nanoparticles in the low temperature regime and for a particular reaction like carbon monoxide you can actually go ahead and beat some of the well known catalysts. And the important parameters of course, in this whole thing is of course, shape of the gold nanoparticles, the size of the gold nanoparticles, the substrate medium is it titania or is it nickel oxide or is it uh, one of the other materials which can be chosen as substrate material. The contact angle that uh, gold nanoparticles makes with the substrate and all this put together it can be seen that uh, there is an effective uh, role that uh, gold in nano scale can actually perform in the case of catalysis and this is again one of those startling effects which you see only when you go to the nano scale. The next chapter we take up is related to the mechanical behavior of nanomaterials and since defect structure plays a very important role in uh, the mechanical behavior we first talk about the defect structure followed by the mechanical behavior of nanomaterials. The defect structure in nanomaterials can be highly altered with respect to bulk materials and this actually plays a direct role in terms of the properties and these properties could be conductivity, diffusion could be uh, you could be even talking about compressive strength or fracture toughness any one of those properties and therefore, and therefore, I need to know the defect structure of nanomaterials and we have already previously defined what is it what does the term defect structure means it terms it includes as we have noted before uh, entities like distribution of defects, um, its uh, size, its overall volume fraction etcetera or length per unit volume etcetera. So, we need to know the defect structure in a material, so that I can understand the profound differences in mechanical behavior of nanomaterials as compared to bulk materials. So, the first of these defects I take up is vacancies, we have already talked about vacancies in the context of diffusion, uh, in the context of sintering of nanoparticles and we have noted that depending on the curvature of the nanoparticle is it going to be convex or concave, we have noted that there can be actually an enhancement in the vacancies or there can be a depression in the equilibrium concentration of vacancies. And we have noted this, we will briefly revise what we mean by the equilibrium concentration of vacancies, we have noted that they are equilibrium thermodynamic defects. And suppose I am for now I will restrict myself to metals, wherein there is no charge involved and the arguments can be simplistic made. We know that it costs enthalpy for a for you for because there are broken bonds when you have a vacancy in a crystal there it costs enthalpy in terms of putting a vacancy. But we also know that there is a configurational benefit when you have a vacancy that means that when you are trying to minimize Gibbs free energy which is given by delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. And for now I am ref, uh, restricting myself to configurational entropy then I can note that there will be an offset because of this configurational entropy 
a certain temperature at each temperature there will be an equilibrium concentration of vacancies. That means, that if I am talking about the Gibbs free energy versus vacancy concentration, then I would notice that there initially will be a depression when I increase my uh, temperature, but there will be an uh, at a given temperature of course, there will be a, when I increase the number of vacancies, then there will be a depression in the Gibbs free energy, but after the equilibrium concentration, then there will be an increase in the Gibbs free energy again. That means, the energy minima appears for only a certain number of vacancies. Now, of course, when you increase the temperature, then you will have an increased concentration of vacancies and you go even further high temperature, there will be an increased concentration of vacancies and close to the melting point in FCC metals like gold, silver and copper, the fraction of vacancies which is given by this formula N V by N is which is depends uh, goes as exponential of minus delta H by K T is about 10 power minus 4, 1 in 10,000 of the lattice sites go missing close to the melting point in these metals. And as I pointed out that as you increase the temperature, the fraction of vacancies keeps on increasing. And therefore, if I take any bulk material and I am talking about any finite temperature like about 300 Kelvin, then I expect an equilibrium concentration of vacancies. Now, what happens in nano crystals? That is the question we are asking. In free standing nano crystals below a critical size, the benefit in configurational entropy does not offset the energy cost of introduction of vacancy. Because now it is a nano crystal, the number of sites over which this vacancy can configure <coughs> are smaller and this implies below a critical size, you expect that vacancies may become thermodynamically unstable. Though this critical size we can call D c, the crystal can become free of vacancies. Of course, uh, if you start from a high temperature and go to low temperature, the kinetics have to permit for these vacancies to escape. Now, for aluminum at 900 degrees Celsius with an activation energy of uh, 0.66 E V, the critical size of the order of about 6 nanometers. That means, aluminum crystals below 6 nanometers will be free of vacancies. That means, such a crystal will have no equilibrium concentration or thermo vacancies will not be in thermodynamic equilibrium if put in such a crystal. Copper with a higher energy for formation of vacancy of about 1.29 electron volts, the critical size happens to be higher of about 86 nanometers. Now, the important point to note in this whole argument is that normally when you talk about configurational entropy, you are talking about Gibbs free energy, we are talking about what is known as bulk thermodynamics. That means, and these uh, uh, configurational entropy comes from the statistical physics, which implies that I am talking about a large ensemble, which means about a mole of uh, atoms or more, which are being uh, sites which are being configured. But in nano crystals, um, obviously, the size of the system is limited. And the important question which arises, can I use bulk thermodynamics for calculation of quantities in these nano crystals? The answer is obviously no, but it has been found that if you apply bulk statistical thermodynamics to even 100 nanometer crystals, so it is found approximately true that the results are reliable. But if you go down to very small sizes like about 6 nanometers, then the classical formulae cannot be used and they need to be modified for nano crystals. Since we are not dealing in detail about the uh, thermodynamics of nano scale systems, but this important effect though the calculation based on this may be, uh, this may be 6 nanometer could be erroneous, but the important thing is that when you go down to small scale system, we do expect that the system will become spontaneously free of vacancies. In other words, the system will not support uh, vacancies as a thermal stable thermodynamic defect, which is what is the case for the case of bulk crystals. Later on we will see when we talk about dislocations also that when you go to nano scale, the system can actually become spontaneously free of dislocations. But in the case the important difference between a dislocation and a vacancy being that in the case of a vacancy, a vacancy can be a thermodynamic defect in bulk which or is a thermodynamic defect in bulk that means, it is thermodynamically stable defect. But dislocation is not a thermodynamic defect that means, it is not stable in bulk, but in nano scale the kinetics become such that it can actually move out of the crystal. So, there are important differences when you are talking about nano crystals vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bulk crystal when it comes to defects. <coughs>